Hello. In this week's Elham at Home conversation series, we are joined by artist, curator, and lecturer Yat Sal Bin. His installation titled The Grand Panther Narrates was part of our most recent exhibition that was held in collaboration with Singapore Art Museum. Hi, thanks for having me here. What prompted you to create The Grand Panther Narrates? Also, how does being part of a collective influence your work? It's a pretty old piece, I think. So it's been a while, and uh, the, the work is actually made for the Ipakat Muda Sezaman. So uh, when I was making that, actually, I was thinking that would be my last participation in the Young Contemporary Art Awards, uh, organized by the National Art Gallery in KL, and sort of thinking that it, it would be sort of a, a wrap-up of my own participation from 2000, 2002, and 2004. So sort of call it a kind of trilogy, yeah? Um, and it's also about reflecting as a young artist then, okay, taking part in a, in a contemporary art competition program organized by the national institution. So not only just thinking about the relationship and the kind of a dynamics between artists and institution, artwork and museum exhibition space, I think is also thinking about my own engagement, I suppose, with the art world in the system in that sense. So this is where I, I draw little, little things from a daily life, my interaction with, uh, with other artists, with my peers, and we, I bring that, I chat that into the work so that there is actually that layers. It was about the same year, I think, when the, which one, which, which Star Mall movie has a grand phantom? Um, phantom Menace? Yeah, Phantom Menace. I don't know which yes, one right. it is, though. So. Yeah. Uh, these are little things that I that, that, that I captured. It's just that as as uh, when I'm thinking through the process of making the work, um, how does all this thing comes into that? It's just some are from daily life, some are from conversation, some are from things that uh, I'm obsessed thinking about, right? And uh, certainly yeah. in the process of thinking about the work uh, to propose it for the young contemporary exhibition that. I wanted to participate in. These are things that we develop, I think, as an artist, or for me, at least, that's my process of designing work in a sense. So different aspect and try to feed them together, at least you know, feed them for me. Uh, I was also part of an artist collective, Roma Aepanas, uh, beginning around 2002 as well. So a lot of our conversation is actually about uh, what can artists do, uh, what can artists do together collectively or even or try to run spaces and what kind of art spaces do we want and vision at that time. So some of this discussion with my, with my peers from my past, including uh, Cha Chang Wang, Chua Chong Yong, Huan Tai Ming, Wong Tae Si, Chong Kim Chiu, they are this as well. We are all talking about that. So this definitely sit into my thinking about my own uh, work. A lot of my work or some pieces of my work is always so probing the kind of a relationship or what is the process or how does an artwork, an object or performance or installation, a project itself gain meanings and what are the different kinds of different contestation involved in turning an artwork or an object or something into something meaningful in an artistic sense. Is it that is being shown in an exhibition when it goes into the museum, when it goes to the gallery, or is it enough if it just exists within the confine of a studio? Or even nowadays, we talk about in a certain social setting that our artists work together with any other collaborators. So these are all uh, things that, or issues that I still think about or interested in thinking about. These are more meta areas that I think about. So when it comes to the specific work, I know that in this exhibition at Ilham and also in the text and also in your question, you asked about like, what does it have to do with the resonation of uh, Dr. Mahathir then? In some of the thinking about the work itself as the title, it was actually about in 2003 when Mahathir resigned. It was quite shocking, I suppose, within the political landscape and social landscape in Malaysia at that time. So I was thinking about that as well as in like, is this the larger social-political landscape that, uh, that we have to deal with? And it seems that we are still dealing with a lot of legacy from different dynamics then. So with that intent and with that kind of reflection, of course, uh, very often 
my work, I think, I tends to conflate a lot of different things into to, to whether the title, whether the uh, visuals and the materials. Um, this is what I do. Um, yeah. What I like to conflate and and bringing that together. So in that sense, that uh, that is where within the positioning in this exhibition itself, uh, the resonation of um, uh, Mahathir seems to be highlighted. Okay, but um, definitely there are more layers and the, the curators working with it, I think they have a, a way of that, it's just that what they chose to bring out to fit into as an introduction to the narrative of this exhibition. Okay. Your piece is the first artwork that viewers are confronted with within the exhibition. It's predominantly red and white and can be viewed from multiple perspectives. Do the formless aspects of the work symbolize anything? The, the vision of the kind of installation I was thinking about, what, what would happen? The frame itself, but it's cut into half. So when it cuts into half, I'm also thinking about creating an illusion of a larger, larger frame in that sense. But the usage of the red carpet is something that I was using in the, the second piece, okay, which is actually the uh, who gave her to a great uh, white one. And then, of course, the red carpet kind of signifying importance to certain social practice and things like that. But I was also thinking about how it's actually play in a very minimal manner that uh, the red is actually quite striking within the kind of uh, white cube spaces, uh, within the kind of neutral background. So that is in terms of designing the visual impact that I was thinking about. At the same time, the treatment when the red carpet are okay, framed by the gilded frame is either protruding from one side or the other. So that's where the reading could be quite different. You know, some reading you know, quite chronologically that you know, it comes from one side and goes out being whitewashed, painted white and things like that, or becoming part of the institution or becoming part of the, the war, annihilated by the context, by the wars. I think that are uh, a kind of uh, interpretation that I do not want to hold on to, but allows others to read the kind of dynamics that they want to or they they might even question. But I think it's also useful to think about that the material itself is actually a very mundane uh, commercial fabrics. Okay, It's the cheapest carpet material you can get in the warehouse. So the idea of like transforming a kind of um, mundane materials an into a language of, uh, of art into something that is displayed in, a, in an exhibition, in a gallery, in a museum, I think that appeals to the mischievous side of my character that I, I like to play with that kind of um, opposition, okay? Where, where do we stop? When do we stop that? Saying, no, no, this is not allowed. This is not uh, uh, considered a kind of a, a mainstream artistic material. Of course, this kind of question has been answered, has been dealt with, but I think it was important for me to go through that myself and to think about the kind of process that I could, I could do in transforming, in working with this kind of material, in asking myself, how do I find uh, whether this is conceptual as well as a visual method mm. of turning such material, for example, or a commercial industrial made carpet into part of an artwork, right? And how can I do that? And this is what I my, my attempt was actually. So that I think un talks about the kind of question of what is an art material? Okay, what kind of foul materials? Or I mean, this of course has been answered as, as well dealt with by by many artists before. Relationship between foul material, the kind of values of uh, industrial products, with kind of uh, values that we we give or we tend to give to uh, artistic work. Do you have a specific set of instructions that curators must follow when installing your piece? Let me rethink. Okay, the first time when the work was actually installed in the National Art Gallery uh, 16 years ago, so the curator then told me that, all oh, right, looking at my proposal, they decided to give me a wall, uh, and it happened to be a kind of protruding wall, a very long protruding wall, and then I got the habit at the edge. So I say, all right, that looks good. Yeah? And so I get to play with that. So, and I say, well, this is the the process when the uh, artwork become uh, falsified, uh, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so 
the, during the process of installing, I look at it and say, okay, yes, this is actually what works for me with that addition. So when Ilham and Sam asked me about installing this piece, I'll just give them the installation manual. If, if a curator comes along and says that I want to install the work and separately and uh, at two different types and not at two different walls and things like that, is that possible? I think for me it's possible, but that is where the process of discussion and, and negotiation should come into. If the artist is still alive, you know, let's do it. You know? Instead of one standalone wall, Right, maybe it's at two different walls and two different sites. I am open for that. I like to imagine that if I, if one day I get to reinstall this piece, maybe one of one site is in KL, the other site in Singapore. How about if I do it here in uh, today? Uh, this piece, this site is in KL, but ten years later, the other site is in Singapore. So the differences is not only spatial; it could be temporal as well, right? And uh. For me, that is important again as my of my practice, which is dealing with uh, the kind of nuances of uh, perception of reading of, of uh, looking at things, and that that kind of uh, issue of perception doesn't have to hit you directly, but it's it comes in very subtle at times. It, it comes in like, oh yeah, I I got it, but maybe it takes a while to settle. Yes, but there's something more niggling in there, something that is disturbing. And uh, I think that is important. Uh, I think that is also making my own self um, uneasy at times with myself. How does this piece fit within the trilogy of your works? Yeah, how does it fit in? Well, it's in that sense, it's because the first piece actually in 2000, uh, Youthful Contention, not, you know, as a parenthesis, not what, you know, not wanting to escape, not uh, rejecting, not uh, despising, not liking the parental eclipse. The parental eclipse could be the National Art Gallery or institution per se, or even the Young Contemporary Art Awards then, where you can say that maybe it's a youthful anxiety, the dynamics of relationship of a young artist in general, or why do we want to take part in the, the Young Contemporary Arts Awards? And mm-hmm. then this is where you can think about the condition at that time, those who were interested in doing more experimental work, installation work, and this I'm talking about 20 years ago, um, it would be interesting to say, right, can we push this kind of work to a national institution, that kind of level? Nowadays, I think they were more open to, to huge installation work as well. So I think looking back at that in 20 years ago, is that uh, it would be a lot of different, I mean, with different artists or peers, and we were thinking about asking this kind of question itself, you know, pushing the boundaries, I suppose, pushing the acceptance or even the language of working with, whether it's installation work, whether it work with, has a conceptual tendency, right, that probes the narrative, that probes the parameter, whether it's the parameter of the exhibition, uh, of the context, or of the institution in a large, larger sense. Uh, not saying that we don't have that. I think they were also, I mean, we have had a lot of other more established artists in the 80s and 90s, which were doing things uh, in that sense, questioning institution, questioning institution, institutional spaces, questioning uh, political and social uh, context, and then in relation of this art spaces itself, right? Um, how can we do that? Why do I want to take part? I think those are all also very self-reflexive questions that I have. So that is where your youthful contention not you know, parenthesis, uh, open bracket, close bracket, um, parenthesis, the eclipse comes into, as in questioning that. So um, the second one, then who gave birth to the great white one, is actually, in a sense, like bringing forward that kind of um, position that I have in the first book itself, okay? So who or what or how, as I mentioned uh, initially, uh, the meanings or values of, the, of an artwork confer and decide it. Can a different interpretation hold in what way, okay? Maybe certainly not in a single moment, but maybe in a single moment there are different different interpretations, there are different meanings, there are different uh, uh, contesting ideas or ways of reading one word, ideally. How is that decided? And in what way that could be acknowledged or could be interpreted, could be allowed for the kind of uh, different readings Okay, of an artwork, of an object, of a um, 
art project in that sense. And this is where I think the idea of the white whiteness, like a great white one or white elephant or white wall, the papers that history, art history is returned on and and the white painting, the white frames. And I, I, I was actually playing with that kind of, uh, of a kind of signifier in that sense to, to allude to that kind of um, the site where meanings actually is contested. And it's not just a white painting or a white wall, but it's a lot of things together, which is in, interconnected. So in that sense, coming to the last piece, I suppose, of that trilogy is that when that work enters, okay, the framing, of the national institution or of the framing of a museum or the framing of an exhibition space itself or the framing of this course, do you get whitewash? How, how much of a resistance can an artwork offer, uh, can an artist offer in a sense, as much as we want to partake and also as much as we want to probe that kind of a narrative or that framing and or that discourse. So I think that is actually the anxiety or dilemma I have or the kind of things that I think about then. Uh, not sure I have resolved it nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, even taking up different position or things like that. It is always thinking about system, meanings, power, what can one do through work, through art, alone, together, collectively. So those are just questions that I amuse myself with. You wrote the artist statement for the Grand Fountain Narrates back in 2004. Do you share the same ideas and sentiments about the piece today? Ah, well, good question. I think I'm still trying to answer that. And uh, depends, again, which aspect of what you are dealing with within the work. I think in terms of the relationship and language of art and materiality, okay, I, I don't think it has changed much, for, changed, uh, much for me, I suppose. But the issues of uh, and values, the meanings of between work and institution and uh, as we, we, we talk about in terms of uh, institution, in politics, uh, art history, for example, uh, those are the things that I'm still trying to, to learn, and trying to think about, to do, to, to deal with. So with the work, I don't think I would say, that, yeah, it has changed, the, the statement has changed. I don't think I need to do that. I think it would be more importantly is that how do we discuss the work as it was then and how uh, the framing and the discourse nowadays could look at the work. Does it give different meanings or does it give certain meaning to us or even to me? Okay, I think so that is the question you asked. But um, like if you talk more specifically about the, uh, the references of uh, Malaysian politics and things like that. Um, has it changed much? I don't, I, for me, I think the kind of uh, issues of uh, fidelistic displays of power and how that kind of uh, social political values is, is very easily undermined and things like that hasn't changed. Sadly, uh, hence my, my little joke is that, wow, how many times can the Grand Phantom narrates and resign? And remember, it, the, 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 the phantom is just not a singular or one specific person. I think the, the phantom and, and the narrative is, in a way, those who want to partake and attempt to grasp that power to dictate, okay? Uh, legitimately, Ill illegitimately, in different ways, whether in the art world, in social political landscapes, and those are part of our... Malaysian reality that we have to constantly deal with, whether it's an artwork or even different art process, is important in, in asking that. Um, I don't have the best answer for myself, and I'm not certainly sure that my artwork might not be the best way of dealing with that. And I think there are much more interesting and exciting artists that can do much more honestly than I can. So I have to find a different language. Right? Yeah. Uh, how do I learn the language that I already been? condition and those are also things that can, can, can one easily decolonialize oneself in that sense. Yeah. Okay? Can I try to live with multiple self? How can we be aware of the double consciousness and continue trying to think a lot of smarter artists and, and scholars have to find ways and have the, the best attitude to approach that. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to message us at Ilham Gallery KL on Instagram.